If you're carrying extra belly fat, not eating right, or not exercising, this show is for you. My guest today is former editor-in-chief and publisher of Muscle & Fitness Magazine. He's one of my best friends in the whole world, Dr. Tom Dieters. Welcome to the show. So insulin is a hormone in the body that's produced by the pancreas. What happens with insulin resistance, the body cells in the liver, etc., don't respond what the way they used to. If you have this situation, um, also more predisposed to all different types of cancer. Welcome to the Lula Brada Show. Welcome back, everybody. Today, you're going to learn about managing a potentially harmful condition known as insulin resistance, and you're going to learn about its connection to fat loss and getting healthier. If you're carrying extra belly fat, not eating right, or not exercising, this show is for you. You guys may have heard of type 2 diabetes before, also known as adult onset diabetes. Insulin resistance is a powerful predictor of adult onset diabetes, and a lot of people have insulin resistance without knowing it. My guest today is former editor-in-chief and publisher of Muscle & Fitness Magazine, a publisher of Flex & Men's Fitness Magazine. He was the director of education for Muscle & Fitness Camps and is a doctor of chiropractic. He's been a successful CEO throughout his career and is a highly sought after consultant. He's also a lifelong athlete, former state collegiate powerlifting champion, and holds a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Now, this is a guy who not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk. Not to mention that he's one of my best friends in the whole world, one of the smartest people I've ever known, and an amazing human being. Dr. Tom Dieters, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Lee. And if I'm the smartest guy you know, you need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tom, let's jump in. So let's talk about insulin. What is insulin? So insulin is a hormone in the body that's produced by the pancreas that is responsible for a number of things, but primarily we know it as being required for transporting sugar from the blood across the cell membrane into the cell so it can get metabolized for energy. The exception is uh, cells in the brain. Uh, you don't need insulin to get uh, sugar into brain cells. So for you know the audience, uh, we're going to get into a couple science areas, but I'm going to try very hard to use as little science as possible to get the concepts across and make it very, very clear so we can focus on the real issues, which is how do we um, how do we deal with some of these problems or challenges and what's the best way to look forward? So, uh, you know, we hear, we hear a lot about a term called insulin resistance these days and, you know, how it ties into type two diabetes, you know, but I don't know that all of us really know what insulin resistance is, you know, what causes it, uh, you know, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Can we talk about that? Sure. So you normal, uh, normally have this checks and balances system in your body, right? You eat a meal uh, or drink uh, a fluid that has a sugar in it uh, or a, a more complex form of carbohydrate or a protein. These things get broken down and then get uh, absorbed through uh, the membrane in the gut uh, into the bloodstream. And then as that happens, blood sugar levels will increase. Uh, the brain and central nervous system monitor that and respond with uh, release, releasing a proportionate amount of insulin to get that, those blood sugars into the cells, right? So when that's working very efficiently, um, you know, blood gets uh, blood sugar gets cleared very efficiently. Uh, the cells get the energy they need from the sugars that gets transported uh, across the membrane with the help of insulin, and the blood sugar levels maintain uh, in a normal range as well. What happens? with insulin resistance is it's pretty much like it sounds. The body, uh, the muscle cells, uh, cells in the liver, et cetera, don't respond uh, what, the way they used to to the same amount of insulin. So now if you eat uh, X amount of sugars, and it used to be that X amount of insulin would clear those sugars, now it maybe takes 2X of insulin to clear the same amount of sugar out of the bloodstream. So that means that we end up with higher levels of sugar in the blood, but actually lower levels of sugar in the cells. So the, the cells can be starving for sugar, uh, while at the same time there's too much sugar in the bloodstream. Now, 
again, there's that exception with brain tissue, which is why you can have, you know, blood sugar levels that continue to elevate so high that that amount of sugar can become toxic to brain cells and can you know, result to, into some, some medical emergency type situations. But insulin resistance happens when our body's not responding to normal levels of insulin any longer. Okay. So um, that's, that's uh, insulin resistance. Now, what are some of the um, implications you know, that come from being, becoming insulin resistant? And, and I'm, I'm assuming it's a process, right? Yeah, so it, um, you're exactly right. And, and if you look at it, again, you have insulin resistance. That requires that more insulin needs to be secreted by your pancreas. Eventually, you can anchor up, end up with what some people have termed as pancreatic exhaustion, where your body just can't produce enough insulin. So blood sugar levels just continue to rise, right? So that hyperinsulinemia um, uh, is, you know, too much insulin in the blood. Uh, and it, it, that's not a good phenomenon because it can affect other systems as well. Um, you get to the situation where you get systemic inflammation uh, and gut issues. We know that if we have high blood sugar levels, uh, that also can stimulate an inflammatory response, which affects the coronary arteries, making them a little bit uh, stickier, uh, which increases the predisposition or chance that you're going to get plaques for clogging can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, and we know that, you know, it almost sounds like it's like a vicious cycle. It's, it's, it's a terrible cycle. And, and the, the other two components I, I want to mention are that, you know, if you have this situation, um, you're also uh, more predisposed to all different types of cancers. We know that the primary, the preferential energy source for cancer cells is sugar, right? So the more sugar you got, the more cancer cells that, and we produce cancer cells regularly, but our immune system usually kills them off, but it's easier for cancers to get a toehold because they can grow much faster in this higher blood sugar environment. Uh, and it also predisposes uh, uh, people to a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, which really is an uh, inflammatory response uh, that the brain has um, and uh, results in amyloid placking uh, and the destruction of, of healthy brain cells. So, you know, this insulin resistance leads to higher insulin levels, higher blood sugar levels, um, and that eventually, as we know, leads to type 2 diabetes, uh, which yeah. is rampant in our country right now. Yeah, it's it's really scary. You know, Tom, I think the last time that I saw the, uh, the stats, I want to say that, you know, maybe a bit over half of the country is uh is obese uh and i know that if you combine obese plus overweight it's probably more than two-thirds of the country right yeah actually unfortunately um they're revising numbers all the time uh but it, it looks like right now currently and i believe these numbers are unreported because there's so many people in this country that aren't being reported uh in terms of the statistics but about half the population is obese uh, and obese means more than 20% over the ideal body weight. And then there's an estimated, you know, 25 to 30% of people who are overweight. So you can't, you can be overweight without being obese, but you can't be obese without being overweight as well. So the point is, is that we're looking at almost 75% of the adult population. Yeah. That's just, that's just amazing to me. You know, Tom and I, yeah, for those of you that don't know, Tom and I went to uh, college together. We went to Northwestern University. That's where we met, you know, and, and that that was a <laughs> that was a few years ago, to say the least. But man, I just don't remember kids being that heavy. You know, it's just like it's just uh, uh, amazing to me just how heavy kids are nowadays. Yeah, well, so we we talked about the the astounding uh, adult statistics, but if you look at kids under age. 12. Uh, more than 60% of them have at least three of the top 10 cardiovascular risk factors, and that is uh, being overweight, uh, being sedentary, uh, or even being hypertensive, because we know that blood pressure will go up as you have more tissue to, to pump blood through. So the trajectory, not just for our current adult population, but for the next 30, 40, 50 years is uh, is not good at all in this regard, which is why 
I, you know, I think that heroic measures almost need to be taken, and there's some new medications out that can help in this regard. But uh, we can um, impact this trend tremendously just with our ind- individual responses. So, on, on that note, you know, the individual response and the and, and the responsibility that we have, you know, uh, towards our kids, at least to our kids, right? If we're if we decide that we're going to let ourselves get heavy. You know, uh, that's one thing, but I mean, you want your kids to be healthy, right? So uh, let me ask you this, you know, it, obviously it starts young, you know, how does this insulin resistance occur? You know, in other words, is it directly related to weight gain or are there other factors? Well, the number one predisposing factor is obesity uh, because the more fat cells you have, fat cells by nature are not uh, very sensitive to insulin. So the more fat cells you have, the more insulin it takes to control blood sugar levels, right? So that absolutely is the single most important um, causative element in developing type two diabetes. Uh, and you know, insulin insensitivity is the precursor of adult onset diabetes. Uh, the other thing about obesity, which people need to understand, and it it came up in during the whole COVID thing, but it wasn't talked about nearly enough. Um, and that is that. Fat cells uh, produce a substance all day long called cytokines. Cytokines are um, inflammatory agents uh, so that someone who just, you know, if some, a healthy person put on 30 or 40 pounds of body fat, their normal level of systemic inflammation would increase dramatically. Now, the challenge with that is, is that when you... Um, have to fight off of a virus or uh, other infection, the immune system response will also create an inflammatory response. And that's mm-hmm. what happened with COVID is, is something called a cytokine storm uh, where COVID particularly would really elevate cytokines. But wait a minute, if we've got an obese person, which normally their day-to-day has high cytokine levels, now it became a problem, and that's when it would uh, be destroying lung tissue, uh, liver tissue, kidney tissue, things like that. So obesity is the number one uh, influencing factor. Lack of lean body mass. Why? Because muscle is our best metabolic furnace that we have. And that's the other part of the sedentary lifestyle, right, is, is that not only uh, don't you have the fitness uh, and the energy that comes with being active and exercising, but when you're sedentary, you lose muscle tissue. So now your body composition goes the wrong way, right? Right. So you gain fat, but you lose muscle at the same time. That's the worst of both situations because muscle tissue, If in fact, if you want to take a person who is insulin insensitive and you want to get their sensitivity to be increased, one of the best things you can do is put five or 10 pounds of muscle tissue on. If I'm hearing right, almost exercise is the medicine. Yeah. And, and, and I, I uh, saw an article that, uh, was trending this week about that very thing that, you know, that exercise may be one of the best things that we have in terms of anti-aging, you know, and obviously the whole anti-aging ties into anti-inflammatory, you know, anti-obesity and such. Yeah, really. I mean, you're a hundred percent spot on Lee. I mean, all anti, anti-aging is, is disease prevention, right? Because if you don't right. get a stroke, you don't get heart disease, you don't get cancer, and you don't get you know uh, diabetes, uh, and yeah, you, you then you prolong your body life. weight. Yeah. You're going to live a long time, right? Right. So um, you know it, it's interesting because what you're saying about exercise being the best medicine. Let's let's mention two things. One, you know, I uh, spent a long time uh, working very closely with one of the greatest guys uh, I've ever met, as Joe Weeder, uh, rest his soul. Uh, but he was saying that exercise was the best medicine back in the 40s and 50s and 60s um, and how you had uh, more vigorous energy, you had more virility. We know that, you know, one of the things that, uh, that uh, corporate executives, and this is from, you know, uh, you know, business school type studies, right? They, you know, the top Fortune 500 CEOs, I think the number is like two thirds of them work out three times a week because they like feeling crisp. They like that cognitive function. And and we know if we exercise, our brain is crisper. We know that lean body mass gives us strength and energy and endurance 
um, not just in the gym, but to be able to manage our day-to-day lives and stresses. We know that body mass, you know, increase increases insulin sensitivity. Uh, it lowers blood sugar levels. We know it it burns off cortisol, which is the stress hormone, which causes so many, you know, negative events metabolically in your body. So exercise and, and fat um, to go further. Uh, and that is, is that if you take a person who's, who is obese and exercises and who is a smoker and exercises versus people who, you know, don't smoke and don't exercise, sometimes they, it depends on the number of cigarettes, et cetera. But you can almost notice in the data a negative effect of bad habits if people would just exercise. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's. Uh... Uh, re- really amazing to me, you know, how, how much uh, of, of a, a role that exercise plays in the long run, you know, in terms of the health and uh, longevity of a person. Tom, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the, the factors that contributed to insulin sensitivity and uh, hyperglycemia, as you call it, the super high blood sugar and, and diabetes, you know, which, you know, is um, uh, a lot of times the end result of, of these things. But are is there any other factors uh, that we should uh, be talking about? Any other, uh, you know, uh, metabolic disruptors and that kind of thing? Yeah, there's. Uh, so let me see. Let's go back just for um, to be clear with everyone, so that we can form different kind of buckets in our mind. Right, the big factors um, are you know being overweight or being obese. The second is is the lack of lean body mass. The third, which we we didn't touch on quite yet, is a diet of processed foods. Uh, and simple carbohydrates, right? Everything nowadays is packaged. Um, it's it's so refined. It doesn't have much nutrient value, um, and not like it should, and it's getting worse all the time. Um, and we know these things cause, that most of the foods cause a rapid increase in blood sugar levels. So, you know, eating organic, eating whole foods, uh, Mediterranean diet, all those things, you know, can be a huge aid a, excuse me, in turning the tide back against the insulin resistance. Um, but all these things, and there's more f- and better free diet and exercise information out there than ever before, right? But people just aren't adopting it. Um, and that's that old thing about, hey, you know, we can sit here all day, you and I, who have lived this lifestyle for, you know, the, the past 50 plus years, right? And we know the benefits, um, and we 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 try to spread the word, if you will, to so many people, and people will nod their head. And we can have <laughs> talked about this, and I've been on airplanes writing up, you yeah. know, workout programs for people, you know, and you know it just is never going to happen. And that's why gym memberships, right? That's a gym. That's a, the the gym model. Sign up a bunch of people and hope they never show up, so they don't break your equipment. And most of them don't. It's amazing, you know. I think some of it comes down to the the uh, the idea that people associate exercise with uh, discomfort. But before I go off on that tangent, I want to come back to something that you said. You said uh, obesity. You know, obviously, uh, being uh, having too much fat on you is one factor. The other factor, not having enough lean muscle. So, is it is it possible that we should be focusing not just on people being over fat, but perhaps under muscled? I, I think it's two sides of the same coin. Absolutely right. Which is why, again, I'll go back and I sound like a broken record. Resistance training, resistance right. training, because that is the most effective way to stimulate caloric afterburn. In other words, you burn more calories after training or resistance training session, not just during the workout, but for the next 48 hours after the workout. And then you also have the stimulation of the muscle tissue which again is a metabolic furnace, right? So I think that that's a kind of a one-two punch. The same exercise modality, again, does all these wonderful things, you know, can decrease body fat, can increase muscle, decreases the stress hormone, can activate the neurochemicals in your brain so you have literally better cognitive function. You know, if you're a a student and you have a, a, a test in the afternoon, you want to get a morning workout in. No question about it, because you can actually measure differences in levels of neurotransmitters, you know, after working out, right? So, you know, it's one of those things, though, that, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, you know? So, <laughs> so you, they say you got to put in the work if you want the muscle. Do, but here's the good news, right? Is you don't need to put in that much work. 
you know, two 20 minute circuit workouts a week, three would be better. But even two shows demonstrable changes. And that's what, you know, people keep saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm really busy. I'm going to start working out next month. They're waiting out for a perfect situation because they think they need to do this whole lever program. No, no, you don't. Get in the gym, do one set per body part, right? And do a couple cycles of those. Be done in 20 minutes. Don't rest, don't stop. Work hard. You have to, you know, you want to exert, right? But it's not as onerous as people make it. But unfortunately, in our society, you know, um, again, people's comfort zone has gotten to be about this narrow. That's right. Let's turn our attention back to the diet for a second. You know, so let's say that, let's say that, uh, someone is watching this, uh, this podcast and they decide to go uh, to the gym, sign up for a gym membership. They want to start an exercise program, but what are some of the things that they should be on the lookout for in terms of their diet? You know, in other words, what, what are some of the things that got them to become insulin resistance, you know, overweight or obese in the first place? And what are some of the things that they can do immediately? Maybe, you know, some small steps that they can take you know, to, uh, to start reversing that? Well, uh, to, the easiest thing is just eat less. Okay. okay. If calories. You, if you, it, total calories. If you don't change anything, if you go in someone's ice, you know, refrigerator uh, or in their pantry and they don't change everything, there's a bunch of stuff in there. It's like, oh, really, dude, this is not healthy. Even if you didn't change any of that and they just ate less, okay, that would be a step in the right direction. Okay. Okay. Um, but once we do want to start cleaning things up, that means that a lot of those simple carbs, a lot of the crunchies, if you will, the chips and, and things like that, they need to be cut down on. The ratio of carbohydrates in your diet needs to be decreased, um, you know, because there's some di some diets that are, you know, less than 20 uh, or, or even 10 percent protein now. You need more high quality protein. Protein is a metabolic right. activator and it's what muscle tissue needs uh, to be able to be maintained or to grow, right? So try to increase the protein, try to decrease the carbs. The hard part because again, you know, comfort time, people like to snack at night while they're watching TV or, you know, whatever it is, uh, that needs to be curtailed. There's definitely, you know, you can you do have to make some changes, but again, these changes aren't catastrophic. It's not like starvation diets are necessary. Um, I would, you know, whole foods, um, read up on the Mediterranean diet, which is an excellent diet for most people, okay? Um, and then eat organic, which will bring us to the next to topic, you know, which you touched on, which is metabolic disruptors. And we're being poisoned, right? Um, we know that. Um, and, uh, that's a problem because we have so many, uh, food additives and things that, um, are really, um, not doing this good on any level. We'll talk about those. Okay. So let, let's, um, um, let's, let's talk about that. In, in other words, we've, we've talked about some of the, uh, the diet in terms of uh, on a macro level, you know, some of the things that, uh, that they can be doing, you know, and I agree with you that it's almost like you can't get too much protein. Cause for one thing, you know, even with, with a thermic effect of protein, the way that protein is metabolized, broken down and all the steps that it goes through, it's hard to overeat protein. Now keep in mind guys that I'm not saying it's hard to overeat steaks. I'm saying it's hard to overeat protein. Okay. In other words, you still have to have lean sources of protein, but, uh, it's, it's hard to get fat, uh, uh consuming too many grams of pure lean protein. Um, let's talk about the metabolic disruptors for a second time. You say that we're being poisoned. That's, um, uh, when I heard you say that, I'm going like, whoa, okay. Like how are we being poisoned? Yeah. And aren't there chemicals, aren't there, be, aren't there chemicals in everything? So, yeah, well, yeah, but chemicals, you know, everybody gets hung up on word chemicals, right? I mean, you could say, well, you know, sodium chloride is a chemical. Yeah, it is. It's got, you know, elements from the periodic table and these molecules are joined together, but I'm talking about toxic chemicals. Okay. Um, you know, the first thing, obviously, uh, well, I don't know what the first thing is because there's a number of first things, but, you know, one is pesticides, right? So many of our fruits and vegetables, the healthy foods, right? We go to the store, we pick up, you know, apples and grapes and, and melon and all these things. And we're thinking, wow, this is really good. 
It is in many ways in the criteria of low glycemic index, modulating blood sugar levels, all this good stuff. But when these things are laced with chemicals that we know disrupts your metabolism, metabolism meaning the way and the rate at which your body burns calories for energy or can increase the risk of cancer, that's a problem. So again, that's why buy organic. Okay. Okay. So now let, let, let me, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Sure. Aren't there pesticides on organic foods also? In other words, there are organic pesticides, but there's also chemicals there, are there not? Yes, but they're less harmful. So we're trying to pay, make the decision that will impact us negatively the least, right? Uh, and then you could say, well, gee, you know, there's acid rain from air pollution and that's, you know, irrigating the organic food. True. But I do know that that's better uh, than buying non-organic in terms of the levels and the scope of toxic pesticides we get exposed to. So the types matter. Yeah. So what are some other uh, metabolic disruptors, Tom? Yes. What are, are some other watch outs? The second one, which is uh, one, of, one of my, um, I don't want to say pet topics, but one of the areas that I think uh, it requires uh, the most attention and has had the greatest impact. And that is is the, <clears throat> you can't get a sauce, a condiment, um, a package good, almost anything, Unless vegetable oil or seed oils like sunflower seed oil, something like that, uh, peanut oil or canola oil is the component of it. Now, this stuff is really cheap, um, you know, so it's, it's cheaper to produce food with these oils. But we know these oils are massively inflammatory to our bodies. Uh, and there have been studies done that where rats were fed just high concentrations of the seed oils and canola oils, and you know what they developed, Lee? Mm -mm. What's that? Diabetes. That's incredible. Now, let me ask you this. Is it the, and, and, you, and we both know that these oils that you're mentioning are high in omega-6 fatty acids. Is it the omega-6 content that is inflammatory and causes uh, the, these illnesses, or is it something else? Well, it's the omega-6, along with the fact that once you cook, in omega-6. Now you can get formations of other chemicals, which are both carcinogenic and or metabolically disruptive, some of the aldehydes and things like that. So, you know, when you talk about a burger and fries, you know, it's maybe not the burger that's going to kill you, it's but the fries. it's more than fries. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's a huge issue. And if you look at how things were done years ago, um, the, uh, the cooking fats, if you will, were animal fats, uh, tallow and ghee. Um, and, uh, if you look at some of the spray fats for non uh, uh, nonstick purposes and things like that, uh, and what the propellants are in those products. Again, um, I, I exclusively, um, you know, try to absolutely, you know, read every label, which is, I gotta tell you, to be honest, it's a little disheartening uh, because, you, again, you really have to search for these products that have, uh, you know, tallow or ghee or some of these animal fats, which are much, much healthier, are not metabolically disruptive, don't break down into near the level of carcinogens of these other seed oils or canola oils. So, Tom, let, let, me, let me ask you this because uh, what you just said um, jogged the thought. You know, you're saying that um, that it's it's very unhealthy to cook with canola oil and these seed oils and that kind of thing. You know, but we've also heard that it's unhealthy to heat up animal fats because of the trans fat content. You know, when it reaches uh, you know boiling point, frying that type of a thing. So, you know, how 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 do we how, how do we answer that? Well, so so then you say, gee, does cooking alone? What is what's the impact of cooking alone? In other words, let me stop and go to 30,000 feet, because this is what happens in these conversations. Every, everybody's got an argument against something. And let me just state, which I did before, we are constantly at this point trying to make decisions that suck the least, <laughs> to put it bluntly, right? So you could say, well, gee, you know, cooking food can, you know, any kind of food, you know, you, you cook a steak and that can produce uh, carcinogens. Or if you barbecue a steak, uh, and you have it over charcoal, that can expose you to carcinogens. That's absolutely correct, right? So, you know, do you want to barbecue your food every meal? No. Uh, do you have the possibility that ghee or tallow 
if it's overheated in particular, uh, can produce some carcinogens, yes. But again, it's not comparable to the canola oils uh, and some of the other seed oils in terms of the detriment to the body. Now, now my, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, is that uh, animal fat is high in omega-6 as well, and it's high in saturated fat. And when you heat it past a certain point, it turns to trans fat. So really, is there any healthy, uh, uh, is, is either one healthy? So that's what I mean. It's a question of degrees, healthier. And if you look at the tallow in the ghee, there's no question uh, on how it, it breaks down that it is less detrimental uh, and less carcinogenic okay. uh, than the seed oils and the canola oils and, or the vegetable oils as they break down. Okay. Right? Good point. Uh, the next factor, which you mentioned, so a, again, I try to get those oils out of my system. And again, even if it's not cookingly, right? Say it's uh, chips, uh, you know, a, a, a corn chip or, or uh, you know, some other thing. If you look at the ingredients, these seed oils or canola oils are almost always a component. So if, you know, that's not the issue of just exclusively what you cook with. I know what I want to cook with, but I also want to avoid it in every other way that I can, which is it's almost unnecessary, okay. right? Tom, is there, is, is there any uh, any other um, metabolic disruptors, as we call it? Yeah. So a cu couple others. Um, again, you know, uh, microplastics. And these microplastics, again, are small, you know, almost molecular sized plastics. Everybody's got them in their body. Everybody has them in most tissues of their bodies, lung, liver, kidneys, things like that. Um, and those things, again, have been shown to be metabolic disruptors, which means that it influences our hormonal axis. Uh, our, you know, we, uh, and again, we could have a separate conversation uh, about infertility in males in this world. I mean, mm -hmm. because if you look at the testosterone level in males, uh, 30 to 40 years old and 20 to 30 years old worldwide, and then look at sperm counts, it is dramatically suppressed. Okay. And that goes back to what are some of the reasons that, you know, the, all these young men are being in, influenced and impacted so severely, and microplastics seems to be at the top of that list. You know, we use it in plastics and food packaging and storage and cooking utensils and, you know, water bottles and, and drink bottles. I mean, every, we are just swimming. Is the idea to, to eliminate drinking from a plastic bottle? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, and, and again, same thing with, um, you know, water sources, you know, everybody's got to buy a water bottle, you know, use a, uh, use a source of purified water, put it in a stainless steel bottle. Um, same thing with showers, you know, our, the largest or organ in our bodies is skin mm -hmm. and we absorb tremendous amounts of chemicals through our skin. And when we take a shower, that's one reason why a, uh, purified, uh, water source for a shower or a shower head it filters out, uh, you know, a number of chemicals, I think is a great idea. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a whole long list of other chemicals as well, chemicals in our toothpaste, and fluorides and deodorants and all these things and makeups, which, oh my gosh, if people knew the list of carcinogens that were in yeah. makeups, skincare products, they'd be shot. It's amazing. You know, I know that a lot of people, when they jump out of the shower, they slather body lotion all over themselves to moisturize, you know, moisturizing lotion. So, yep. you know, I guess, I guess we better start reading the, uh, the labels on that. You know, it, it sounds really uh, a bit overwhelming when you think about it. So <laughs> what do we do about all this? Well, it, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, it is overwhelming uh, because the, we have these issues that we have to deal with. And the last one I just want to touch on before we move on um, is uh, these forever chemicals, which are in that stick coatings. Um, and uh, again, you know, using utensils that don't have that, that coating, I think is a wise move using uh, non-plastic utensils, wooden utensils, I think are, are, are a great thing. But most importantly, for anybody listening to this, they're like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm checking out, man. We're going to die anyway, which is 100% true, right? Life is fatal. Um, but we want to make sure that we can try to live the longest, healthiest life possible. No one wants to live the last 20 years or 10 years or five years of their life, you know, suffering from a disease. Really, that's the name of the game, you know. Uh, and you and I have talked about this. We're not interested in living to 100. We're really interested in living as long as God uh, blesses us to live. Amen. And we want to live as vigorously as we can during that process. 
So don't throw up your hands and give up. Um, that would be my number one take home is yes, it sounds overwhelming, but little changes can bring about big results, right? And let me just touch on those, right? First, exercise, right? Two to three times a week, you know, resistance train, uh, and resistance train for strength, by the way, uh, because it's not just lean body mass it's strength. So that means, you know, doing sets that, you know, uh, 10 reps or less generally uh, are a good thing. And those are the ones that stimulate your metabolism the most as well and stimulate um, lean body mass preservation and development as well. So that'd be number one is exercise, meaning resistance training at least twice a week, right? Second, lose some body fat. Right. And that's a combination of diet and exercise, as we know, but do it over time. Um, and a lot of times you can move the needle substantially just by changing some things that everybody knows that they need to change, uh, which could mean the junk foods. When I mean junk food, I don't just mean, you know, uh, any one food, but I mean foods that we know that are highly processed, don't have any nutritional value except that they, you know, cause rapid increases in blood sugar level. Right. Um, eating at night, uh, you know, that's one of the things. Look for, creative ideas and again search the internet tons of great stuff out there to replace things um i'm a, a crunchy salt guy um and my go-to snack particularly at night and is, you know is celery you know um and it's it's crunchy it's low calories it's got fiber and all that kind of good stuff and it's really you know for me anyway it's 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 work to satisfy you know some of those crunchy salty kind of cravings right so exercise lose some body fat you know eat less in general uh and then try to eat, eat uh, less toxic foods, right? Um, stay away from, you know, something like a, you know, a fast food French fry, which we know is just, you know, not good on the blood sugar level, as well as exposure to carcinogens and, and metabolic disruptors and things like that. Um, I would investigate the animal fats as a substitute for a lot of the canola oils and vegetable oils and things like that. Um, drink purified water. I don't think purified water gets enough attention. Um, in fact, you know, maybe it's one of the first things we should mention because it, there's, there's pesticides in our waters, there's pharmaceuticals and drugs in our waters, there's heavy metals and toxins in our water. So get yourself a good home water purification system um, and uh, make sure that you bathe and you drink purified water. That will go a long way. Um, and then last, you know, try the best you can. Um, I don't, I don't have any, uh, uh, plastic food storage containers, you know, in my home, it's all glass. Um, uh, you know, I use wooden utensils and things and all these things over time. Now, you know, at our age, we've already been exposed to a tremendous amount. Uh, but I just want to do the best I can to try to minimize that future exposure as I know you do Lee. That's, that's great. That's great advice, Tom. Tom, listen, but this is, this is, just been awesome. But before we wrap it up, I want to tell our viewers about a project that you and I worked on called the Lean Body Fitness Camp. It's an on-demand video masterclass. Guys, Tom and I have crammed all of our most effective fat loss and muscle building tick, uh, tr uh, tricks, tips, strategies that we've learned over the last 40 years from training people. And we've put it all on this on-demand video masterclass. Just want to let you know that you can find it at leanbodyfitnesscamps.com. And this masterclass is the fast track path to achieving your goals. Whether you're a complete beginner in the gym or an advanced athlete, check it out now at leanbodyfitnesscamps.com. Tom, great job today. It's been so incredibly informative. I just want to thank you for joining me. Hey, my, my pleasure, Lee. And again, um, you know, we're not here to hear ourselves talk, right? We just hope that our, you know, our message can help somebody. That's what this whole thing and this whole life really is all about. So um, I hope there were some nuggets in there that uh, for people. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, execute, execute, execute. That's right. You got to, you got to, you got to do it, right? You got to put it into right. action. So and you uh, can do it. Everybody can. Yes, we and can. Just start out small. That's right. Start small steps. Small dietary changes, small exercise routines, do 10 push ups in a, in a uh, you know, a day. Whatever it takes to build that momentum and build that confidence. I love it, bro. Thank you so much. It's great. Thank you. And help us to grow the Lee Labrada show by sharing this podcast with one of your friends and be sure to hit the subscribe button. All right, you guys, stay motivated, get up, and look up. God bless you. The Lee Labrada show. My life flashes right before me. 
thunder from a distant shore. Voices in my head. to the same amount of insulin. So now maybe takes 2x of insulin to clear the same amount of sugar out of the bloodstream. The preferential energy source for cancer cells is sugar, right? So the more sugar you got, the more cancer cells. So you can not you can be overweight without being obese, but you can't be obese without being overweight. If you want to take a person who is insulin insensitive and you want to get their sensitivity to be increased, one of the best things you can do 